Hi, everybody. My name is Dara McNamara, and I'm involved with Imdalo Technologies, uh, an Irish-based uh, software consultancy. And uh, normally what we do is a lot of machine learning and uh, computer vision, but uh, <coughs> we were uh, engaged to uh, do a little bit of work on, um, uh, <coughs> on RISC-V uh, processors. Um, so today what I want to talk to you about is uh, some of the work we've done on this RISC-V processor and then as a result of which uh, we found that we, we needed to uh, do some work on QEMU. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the extensions that we've put into QEMU and uh, where they're at with regards to uh, upstreaming. Okay. So... <coughs> um, the, the SOC that we're interested in is Sci-5's U54 Coreplex. And um, from our point of view, the interesting uh, thing about this SOC is that it's got uh, five processor cores on board. So they're, they're pretty beefy and they're pretty much designed to run you know, something in the order of Linux. But what we were engaged to do is to see, can we... Um, <coughs> can we separate the execution context uh, of these processors? So, for instance, can we get some real-time uh, uh, behavior on one core and then maybe run Linux on the other core? So if you start thinking about um, applications in the area of avionics or automotive particularly, the idea is that one of the cores may be doing something uh, real-time super critical, like running your anti-lock braking systems, and the other cores are running your infotainment system. And th this is kind of attractive because, you know, it, it, it's ultimately it's cheaper to have just one set of cores on board. But the problem that comes in, of course, is that it's absolutely critical that these cores are kept separate or that they can be clustered up into, into effectively two zones. So <clears throat> if, you, if you look at the kind of architecture that uh, we can up with or have come up with thus far, you can have, you know, maybe three of the cores running Linux, <coughs> and then one of the cores is, uh, is, is running your, your absolutely critical uh, system. And the way we've done that is we've organized that one of the cores, the E51, has got special privileges, effectively it boots first, and what it then does is manages the access of the other cores to what normally would be the shared resources. By default, it's, it's effectively a free-for-all. All the cores are able to uh, contact or communicate with any of the peripherals or with use any of the memory. So <coughs> what, what, what this coreplex uh, has is PMP's physical memory protection. Uh, so there's a system on the cores where regions of the memory, including the I.O. space, can be shared between the different processors. So <coughs> the E51 then effectively sets up the PMP blocks, allows whichever cores need access to, say, the CAN bus or to the Ethernet or whatever the peripherals may be, and sets up regions of memory that each of the cores can access. And it then, effectively, the hardware polices itself thereafter from that point of view. But the thing is, now that those cores can no longer communicate directly with a particular peripheral, or they have lost the access rights to uh, autonomously uh, move uh, blocks of memory around via, via DMA, uh, how we solve that is they now send requests to the E51, which manages the peripherals and manages things like DMA. So I'm just going to talk just a little bit about the, the E51 now. So <clears throat> now that E51 software that's running, uh, in one sense what you've done is you've localized all your problems to one particular core. So <clears throat> the approach we've taken to uh, developing the firmware on that E51 is to make it effectively as simple and as deterministic as possible for a whole pile of reasons. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's conceivable that would be uh, subjected to a malicious attack, to all sorts of just random bugs and all sorts of things. Plus, if you're taking this into the uh, avionics business or into the automotive business or etc. related businesses, 
there's all sorts of certifications like D0178 and various other ones that need to be um, <clears throat> that need to be done. So obviously, the simpler the code, the easier it is to take it through these processes. So <clears throat> at, at that point, um, that was fine. But where we ran into uh, an issue was, of course, we, we didn't have hardware. Uh, we were designing uh, effectively the, you know, how this system was going to be. But the hardware didn't exist yet, and I mean, even typical techniques like uh, you know building building out the hardware or piece of the hardware on FPGA, or using simulators, um, it was a little bit too early for the FPGA and uh, simulators. As anyone who's done this type of thing will know, have to be shared with a with a large number of people. So <clears throat> we 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 thought maybe the best way to for us to go forward was to implement the extensions we needed to the RISC-V port of QEMU. And we thought, yeah, it would be nice to do that anyway, and then we could upstream uh, uh, any changes that we made. So um, it, the thing was, the RISC-V port, uh, there was a few things that we needed to do. So what we had to do was, uh, if, if effectively, we've, we've <clears throat> we, we had to make a few changes to support the 110 privilege spec. Uh, we needed to get the heart synchronization, the uh, interprocessor interrupts going. Um, shared memory was okay. The, the PMPs, we needed to model the physical memory protection because that was really at the heart of, uh, uh, of our design. And then we, we found there was no click or clint in the, in, in the RISC-V QEMU, so we put those in. And then while we were at it, we, we modeled the, um, the L1 and the L2 cache and their ability to transform from cache to, to effectively, let's say, loosely and tightly coupled memory, depending on the cache level. So <clears throat> just in a few general points about where we're at, you know, we were pretty happy with how it enabled us to accelerate our uh, SOC software development. Uh, we just support RISC-564 uh, 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 bit. Uh, we, we haven't actually up, upstream, but we're, we're well in the, in the process of doing so, and we're, we're pretty hopeful that over days rather than weeks, um, we, can, we can get it upstreamed. And we're at a stage where it's pretty much functionally working. It, it boots Linux across uh, five cores, and so it's a little bit slow, but it works. Um, just to drill into it a little bit more, I, I won't dwell on that. You can probably read it fast and I can talk about it. These are some of the changes that we did uh, to go from 191 to 110. Um, <clears throat> these are some of the changes that we made then to uh, support the, 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 the multiple hearts. Um, the, the, probably the most interesting one is that we, you know, we added the support for the PMPs in the CSRs. And then we put some sort of enforcement logic on it. I suppose the reason I'm calling it out is that enforcement logic maybe is not as perfect as it could be, but I think it's emulated reasonably well. Um, <clears throat> so we, we ended up adding a, a, a driver, a, a pretty comprehensive driver uh, for a finish for uh, the PLIC um, and, the, and the Clint. Um, so we had to move that around a little bit and then support the uh, IPIs. So I think um, our future plans, we'd like to get a little bit quicker. Uh, we haven't put in the vectorization of the local interrupts, but that, it's kind of a small thing, but we should be able to do that. We, <coughs> we have an idea that it, it might be nice if QEMU supported a device tree. So it might be nice if you were able to just provide um, uh, a device tree blob to QEMU and just have it construct your your core or your multiplex or whatever it is, uh, rather than having to effectively at compile time specify a number of options. Um, and another idea that we're uh, toying with is that, um, particularly for people who are developing peripherals on FPGAs, and particularly if they're on older generations of hardware, is well, why not just use an actual real FPGA to instantiate whatever it is about your design 
and then we could just have QEMU tramp the, basically the sets and gets through QEMU to the real hardware over and back. So effectively it means if you're targeting a new piece of hardware, you should be ready to go the minute you get silicon. Uh, and then we, we want to clean it up and just uh, get it up, upstreamed. Um, and there seems to be enough interest for, for, for that to happen. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. So just here in Amdala, we're developing some safe and secure uh, firmware for separating uh, hardware contexts on uh, multi-core uh, RISC-V processors. And we want to do that in such a way that it's, uh, it's possible to certify the, the, that, that software as being, let's say, D0178 compliant, something like that. As part of our journey, we ended up uh, uh, extending QEMU to uh, more accurately model the, uh, the hardware that we're involved with. And uh, we, we thought that we'd just push that uh, QEMU code um, back upstream. Um, I think that's everything that, uh, that I'd like to say.